Okay. Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. So, first things first, my name is Jean, and I work with NUS. You will hear my story later. Um, but first, I'd like to start with another story, just to get us warmed up and to set the tone for this two-hour session. So to start with a story, this time last year, I was actually seated in front of a room like now, only I was sitting in front of a whole bunch of Japanese military cadets and they were all guys. And over the next few months, I was going to teach them English in Japan and my Japanese was almost non-existent. But the point is that we started off learning how to say really simple things like good morning, how are you, how are you today, how was your weekend and then as time went on they started opening up and we started to get to know each other and then they came up with special requests like a really popular one was this is all very useful English but you know we're not really going to look at going to the doctor or going on a trip, what we really want to know is how do I pick up an English girl in English. <laughs> so that to them was really important. And, and the point of me telling the story is that in any sort of a day workshop or even over the course of a few months, you go through a journey with your peers, with the person sitting next to you and also with the teacher or the facilitator or what have you. You go through this learning journey and I feel it's always most fulfilling if you think of it as a journey and, and the fact that the journey doesn't stop there. So to end what happened with the Japanese military cadets, we did go through the whole syllabus over the three months. It was really nice. I did teach them how to pick up girls in English because honestly, they were quite clueless. The first thing that I asked them was, what would you say? And they were like, how old are you? <laughs> would you say that on a first date? That is classic dating 101 no-no. So yeah, they had a lot to learn. It was a great journey. And this is what I hope. We're only going to be here for a couple of hours, but this is what I hope the day will be like. So to get started, today is all about you. So this is about you mapping out where you want to go, what we're going to explore. Um, I'm going to share a bit about my personal journey, just as a few like lessons and tips and tricks to take away. And then we're also going to look at what is data because it's a simple question, but it's also not a trivial question. And it's actually quite nuanced. And if you want to get into data, firstly, you have to know what is data. And then we're going to have a little exercise into gathering data and dealing with it just to get you comfortable with the idea of what data is and what you can do with it. And then we're going to look at some browser-based resources that you can look at. And I'm going to point you to more resources that hopefully after today, you can then go away with. So like I said, today is all about you. And I've been speaking for long enough. So I'm going to get you guys warmed up with an icebreaker. So. You are all in pairs. You get together in a pair if you are not already in one and ask each other this question. Go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
everybody had a chance to share their story. Okay, not yet. Okay, I think everyone has had a chance to speak. We are now going on to the next question.
are now all nice and warmed up. So again, it would be really nice if we have a nice supportive atmosphere. So another thing that I would like to practice to get us in the mood is later on we're going to have a lot of sharing. And when you stand up and speak, after that, I'm going to ask everybody to do what's called a stomp clap. So after somebody finishes um, speaking, you want to go stomp clap, and then you go stomp clap. OK, let's practice that. Give her a stomp clap. Yeah, OK, and again, stomp clap. Cool, OK, so after anybody speaks, we're going to not go the, ah. Oh. <laughs> That's not what we want. We want a full enthusiasm, stomp clap. OK, so this, after icebreaker, I am going to talk a little bit about how I came to do what I do. And later on, because I get this question a lot, so I thought I'd put it out and share my story, first of all. And then later on, if anyone wants to ask about, again, what is data? What are the roles out there? How can I get involved? Then by all means, come and talk to me. And um, the key message I want to get across, basically, is the subtitle in the slide, Random Walks and Little Bets because it's all very well to talk about empowerment and yeah, you just need to go for it, you know? You go, girl. You can do anything. The reality is there are so many different forces in the world. Your job, your boss, your family, your degree, whether you did computer science or marketing. So going into a new career like analytics which is not actually very well defined actually requires you to manage all these factors which is the biggest lesson that i've taken away hence the title of my talk which is random walks and little bets so what do i mean by a random walk is basically you sort of meander around right and then little bets means you don't know what the right answer is. So if you're like a poker player, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You diversify, and you experiment, and then you see what pays off. So those are the two themes I want to get across, basically. So what do I mean by a random walk? This brings me on to my first story. So I studied in the UK, and my degree is actually in plant and animal biology. And I don't even... <laughs> I don't even mean genetics and working in a lab, although I did work in a lab. What I also did a lot of was go on field trips in Wales and go to Spain in the cloud forest to look at flowers. And we filmed badgers and beavers at night, and then we would go and count the bats as they came out. And some unfortunate freshmen got caught doing it on camera. That was the, the camera was set up to, to film the badgers ostensibly, but then, you know, freshers and getting it on in a field trip, and they accidentally got filmed as well. So, um, ouch, don't do that. But that was my degree, basically. And, and then I realized out of my degree that I was very interested in systems and code, hence genetics, because genetics itself is a code as well. But then, OK. What are you going to do? The obvious path is to then do a PhD or work in a lab, right? But why? You're severely underpaid. That's the reality of it. And then many people end up burning out. So what do you do? So then you, I started experimenting a lot, again, little bit. So random walk, I was in the UK doing something like plant and animal biology. That was a bit random. So what do I then do with it? Okay, let's experiment. So I did a stint with the UK government looking at experimental trials in education. So experiments, you know, science, all that, maybe that will work. And then I also did a lot of work with charities and trying to quantify their impact. So again, data and how that works. And then I worked with a social media company looking at their data. So I didn't know what would pay off. So I just did lots of different things. And I found that I really loved data. It wasn't even 
about, oh, data scientists get paid a lot. Maybe this will be better than working in a lab. I just completely fell in love with it. Like, oh my god, an Excel file. <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really geeky, but that's how I got started. And so I discovered through making these little bets that, OK, otters and badgers are really cute, but uh, maybe data is just as, just as good. So OK, step one. Um, then what happens after that? I didn't want to. I didn't want to do further studies, and I didn't want to get a job straight out of uni. So I went on an exchange program to Japan to teach Japanese and learn English. So, I mean, sorry, not teach Japanese and learn English. <laughs> um, Lear, teach English and learn Japanese. So a completely different about turn, again a random walk. And I taught everybody from young kindergarteners to the military like I talked to you about and 80 year old um, grandfathers whose English was actually better than mine. And, and so it was a really cool experience. I also worked in an, on an organic farm, so actually planting in the hot sun, not very, it's it, it actually quite tough. And then babysat the little boy, we made our own jam, ran a cafe on the weekends. And where does that, where, where does that all bring you, you know? It's, it's a totally random walk. How does that relate to biology, which relates to data? And so my year in Japan was up. I had a lot of fun. And so then I went back to the UK because um, a return flight was included in my scholarship. And OK, now you get down to it. Let's start applying for a job. So you spend all your days um, tailoring your resume and sending it out and talking to people and going for interviews. I mean. We've all been there, right? We've all been there, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and it's like crickets. No response. And again, so lots of random walks, and then little bets. OK, um, no one's taking the bait. Why is that? What am I missing here? You know, Some key misconceptions or actually shallow perceptions. Oh, I want to get into data. Therefore, I will be a data scientist. Oh, um, to be a data scientist, they're asking for a PhD, but I don't have a PhD. Or you think, oh, um, people say that AI is the next thing to get into. I'll do AI. What exactly is AI? What, what exactly are the skill sets needed? You know? And then I found there was this mis mismatch between what I had to offer and what people were asking for. And so again, lots of little bets. So I got in touch with an education technology startup um, from a university connections and we did a project together. And that was really cool because A, it taught me that you can, you can always blend what you already have and then sort of work from there. So I'd worked in data and I've worked in education. So education technology startup was the was the next logical choice. But then they couldn't sponsor my visa, so then that fell through, you know, real life intrudes. And OK, that little bet didn't work out. And then randomly, I got on the train to go to Reading to go to this Google Developers Conference, even though I wasn't even a developer. I'm not a software engineer. I'm more into the data side of things. And then I got talking with the organizer, because as a girl, you really stand out. I was like this <laughs> sore thumb in a sea of men. But then thankfully, the organizer herself was a woman. And so she came up to me and like, oh my god, another one. We have to get you involved. And so that was a little, that was a little um, incident that really helped me. So she said, OK, well, you can, you know R. I started out with R. And she said, well, we're a developers group. So actually, developers don't know R. It would be good if you could come and talk about your experiences with R and what it's used for. So OK, where is this going to go? I don't know. But it turns out that they were actually working with Google. And they put together this whole one day workshop with Google. And then I was featured alongside them, you know, like this little hanger on. <laughs> at the side, and then but then I got to do a two-hour workshop talking about R, 
And because I was talking to developers, I managed to stand out because as developers, R was new to them. And so from there, what do I do? I don't know. Well, it seems like I've got a combination of education and a little bit of data and a little bit of R. And so again, you, I kept on, yeah. What is R? R is a programming language for statistics. <coughs> yeah. So, OK, so I, I kept talking to people. And in the end, I got in touch with the Singapore company that was like, oh, you've done training and you know R. So can you come and do training for us? And so, OK, this seems to be paying off. So bye bye, London. Hello, Singapore. And then I got my first real job in data analytics. And now we work with NUS to put together their data analytics courses. And for some reason, I'm actually listed as an adjunct associate professor. But it sounds it's a lot better than it sounds like. But the key point is that now I get to blend education with training, with programming. And I get to do a lot of research plus consulting, which is like a dream come true for me. But the reason why I'm sharing my story with you is if you want to get into analytics, you know, random walks and little bets. You have to keep that in mind in my experience. Th that has been the biggest lesson for me because it's all very well, again, like I said in the beginning, to say, yeah, you can do anything, women empowerment, go, go, go. But what do you do when real life intrudes, when the resume comes in, when, when the job description comes in and says, sorry, we're only hiring you if you have a PhD in computer science in this one algorithm? or the, the resume comes in and says, we want all these skills with Hadoop and Big Data and Kafka and Spark and all that. And you're like, what is Spark? What is Kafka? You don't even know. So yeah, um, just do lots of little experiments and always be learning. And hopefully, that's how you manage randomness and how you manage real life to get into analytics. So OK, let's start with what I was talking about first. This is an exercise in mapping what is data. So a key, even amongst the experts, they come in and we talk to them. And you say, what is data? And nobody actually has a clear answer. So again, like I said, this is a very simple question, but it's not a trivial question. And it's worth thinking about when you want to get into data, because there are just so many different types of data. People's first reaction is to do a Coursera course, say you want to be a data scientist, and then move into AI. But I want to illustrate through this session that you have that it's good to have a proper think about the landscape. And I'm just going to map out the landscape for you. So let's start with, you've all got your post-its. So I'm going to start with where people are right now. And then we'll sort of move on from there and take a tour of the data landscape. So with your partner, could you please take a couple of minutes to write down what you think data is and what are some examples of data? <laughs> OK, so everyone probably has had some time to, to list down their thoughts, what you think data is. So I'm going to, me and my lovely assistant, we are going to get you guys to put some ideas out there. So, Miss, what do you think data is? <laughs> Data is like a set of uh, numbers or information that you could actually um, put together to like um, tell a story or to reflect like market sentiments. Okay, can we give her a strong clap? Okay. Um, just in case, um, my name is Fish. I'm not some random person. So um, um, I'm gonna pick someone from this side, and you look familiar. So. <laughs> Yeah, I look at me too. Um, what we have brainstorm is that information is a uh, pieces of um, random data uh, that we can 
analyze and see and sometimes maybe massage it according to where you want it to go to. <laughs> so that's how we see the thing. <laughs> okay, so so we have numbers and we have this idea of massaging data. So who knows what data cleaning is about? Yeah. Who doesn't know what data cleaning is? Okay, data cleaning is when your numbers come in and it's all in the wrong format. Your, your dates are like month and year, but you want it to be day, month and year then you have to get into the right format. So that's what you do when you massage the data. Okay. <laughs> um, next, Let, let's get a few more going. I want about 10 people to speak. So next, any volunteers? Yeah, okay. Quantified information. Quantified information is whatever I would call data is. Like, uh, okay, information uh, can be qualitative, as in um, um, uh, anything, I any mean, research or anything. But if you put that research into numbers, that's data. So, like, okay, can we give her a strong clap? Okay, that's, that's a very interesting point that I want to bring up because data is quantitative. Who agrees? Data is quantitative and qualitative. Who agrees? OK. Um, keep your hands up. OK. Um, miss, why do you think data is both qualitative and quantitative? <laughs> We can see the facts and evidence through the quality and community stuff. <laughs> okay. Um qualitative and quantitative. So traditionally quantitative means numbers, right? And qualitative means words. Isn't it? Especially if you're a social scientist or you're from a business background, you collect your survey data you collect your opinion data and all of that as words. So what happens when you can encode words as numbers? Then words can also become quantitative, right? So if you take out your phone and you use Google Translate or you use, say, a voice recognition software, anybody use Xiaomi or <laughs> okay, yeah, so when you use a translation app or anything like that, or when you type a product review into Amazon, then you can actually model language by, this is very mathematical, but you can put your words into a vector. Everyone should know what a vector is. Right, yeah, very simple. Okay, you put your words into a vector, and then you can do cool mathematical things with that vector. Or you can also apply statistics to your language. So then I want, the reason why I'm saying this is I want to push the boundaries of what you think data is. Because like I said, it's not a trivial question. If you want to get into data analytics, you better know what you're getting into. And so language is big. NLP, if you think about Carousel or Etsy or Amazon, they've got all those product reviews, all of that is going into their natural language processing number crunching machine. So if you're thinking about data analytics and you work in marketing or sales, that may be something you want to get into. Okay, so Fish, pick another person. Is he a volunteer? I got one yeah, back. Um, we have a group discussion and we just have some keywords. So we thought data relates to like useful details, information, <coughs> secrets, numbers, privacy, parts, <coughs> complex complexity, and yeah, basically it's like all those keywords relates to data. 
So you said many keywords, and uh, maybe what if you pick three that you think is the most relative to data? What would you say? Um, what What do the group say? <laughs> <laughs> You know, to rephrase, uh, kind of like point out that I guess it's bits of information when you actually put them together, give you some insights to it. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Y
what is data? I'm going to ask the gentleman to share his perspective. I think uh, information that has the potential to be mixed and stuff. Okay. General stuff. Okay. Um, stop, clap. And now I'm going to ask you to choose somebody. isn't it? Information, bytes, numbers, ones and zeros, but we all know that that doesn't cover the full picture, right? So one more person from this side of the room, Fish. Any volunteers? Sorry, this side. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Anyone else here? Would you like to try? That's it, that's it. I said data is records of the real world in quantifiable formats. In what format? Quantifiable formats. Okay, I think that that's a good definition. Do you want to use a mic and repeat it to the room? I said data is records of the real world in a quantifiable format. Okay, very interesting information about the world in quantifiable format. Okay, let's explore that for a moment. Okay, quantifiable format, but information about the world encoded in a quantifiable format. So let's think about we've had language encoded as a vector, like I said, and what about images? You can encode images in a quantifiable format. You can, can you encode music in a quantifiable format? Audio signals? Yes. And what else is there? Can you encode feelings in a quantifiable format? Five stars, four stars, three stars? Yelp, in a way, yes. Satisfaction? Maybe, right? Yeah, so I think that's, that's a really good definition because if you think about anything, you basically think, how do we represent this mathematically or with numbers or even in a structured format that you can then manipulate? Yes. Okay, so we have had a lot of ideas about data and to sum up I think we've got this idea of information and of quantifiability. So I'm going to get you to open your laptops now and let's have a look at this dear data. Ooh, Wi-Fi. Okay. <laughs> Can you call Anne? Yes. <coughs> okay, for those... Anyone have their phones or no? Okay, so while we're waiting for Wi-Fi to get sorted, we are going to, again, talk to your partner about how does data apply to you? So we've, we've had this, we've explored this idea of what data is. And remember from my, my sort of like story at the beginning, you want to, if you want to get into data analytics, you sort of, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You start with what you have and then think about how you can move it into the analytics space. So where are you coming from? I'd like you to share with your partner a few thoughts about how data applies to you and what you want to do with it. 
So go crazy. Okay, so these are the connection instructions. And this is the website that it would be good to visit. So who has not connected to the Wi-Fi yet? Okay, any problems? Who has connected to the Wi-Fi? Okay, for our next exercise, I'd just like you to browse this website and talk to your partner about your favorite week. The, so these, these projects are organized by week. So I want you to talk to your partner about your favorite week and why it was your favorite week. Then you can see a week of clocks, a week of thank yous, a week of to-do lists, a week of emotions. So pick a favorite one and talk to your partner about it. Anyone with no Wi-Fi? Anyone who hasn't accessed the... It's, uh... <coughs> Thank you. 
そうですね。Have a seat again. Okay, one more person. Do I have a volunteer? No volunteers. Okay. Do something random. Okay, could I ask you to share with us your favorite week? Oh, okay. Uh, week seven are complaints. Oh. <laughs> uh, music and then there's a enough of color. And um, both what jo Georgia and and Stephanie did. I mean, yeah, there's enough illustration and enough description. Ah, okay. So you see that she's represented complaints as musical notes. And on the other hand, you also have data as color, right? So, could you ex do you under if you understand how the data is represented? Can you explain to us what the musical notes mean? 
Oh, okay. Okay, so if we look at the description, oh, and if you scroll down, you can see how they've come up with it. So, So the key, the key message I wanted to get across with this exercise is that data is not only all about computers. Actually, pen and paper itself is a technology, if you think about it. <laughs> it's, it's one of, it, for many, many centuries, it was the most advanced technology, the cutting edge. <laughs> So let's not forget pen and paper. And personally, I always sketch before I approach a problem. And so yes, the takeaway is that data is everywhere. And if you want to get started, often art is another way of doing it. Data visualization and data journalism and storytelling is something really important right now. So if you are into that, by all means, go for it. So we've looked at sort of like very analog, old school data. Now I want you to visit this website called Hint FM. And honestly, I'm a huge fan of Fernanda Viegas and Martin Wadenberg because they're sort of like a, um, they're, they're a team and they always turn up to conferences together and she speaks for half of it and then he speaks for half of it and they're sort of like this dynamic duo and it's really, really fun to watch. So, Fernanda Villegas and Martin Wattenberg work with Google and you can actually see an embedding projector is High dimensional data is used when you use your machine translation app. And like I said, can you convert language into numbers? And you can. And the way people do that is to construct an embedding. But what is an embedding? You know, honest question, not many people know. So this is a visualization to understand embeddings. And what I actually want you to explore is this one, TensorFlow Playground. So has anyone here heard of TensorFlow? Yeah, I see some raised hands. Right, so TensorFlow is Google's machine learning platform. And Microsoft also has a platform that's similar. It's called CNTK. And there are others as well. Um, I can't really remember off the top of my head, but they're all open source. So Microsoft or Google, doesn't matter which one you use. But to give you an idea of what is also going on right now, we're moving to the other end of the spectrum. Play around with, this is a neural network, which is brain-inspired computing that's all the rage right now. So just have a play around, press play. So what it's actually trying to do is that if you have two you have a blue column and then you have an orange column and what you want the algorithm to do is to separate, to recognize that this is blue and this is orange. So you can imagine if you're in the fashion industry and you have two dresses and you don't want someone to sort it, you want a machine to sort it, then you would put this algorithm into the machine and then the machine will learn how to differentiate the two categories and this is how you're actually training the algorithm right here in your browser. So have a play around with it. You can add more features or make it squiggly and then watch the network being trained. And here you say, um, um, what is a neural network? So this tells you about it and then this is cool. What library are you using? So yeah. Take about five minutes to see what it's actually doing, read the descriptions.
so I think everyone has had a chance to watch all the little squiggles come together. So the point of this exercise is to show you the other end of the spectrum. So data can be really simple and it can be beautiful and it can be art and can be used to communicate but you can also teach, you can use data to teach machines essentially. What you're doing with massive amounts of data which is what people are really excited about is to basically teach them how to do this. So all the newfangled AlphaGo stuff that you are learning about or that you read about in the newspapers comes down to something similar to this. However, as we've explored before, data and analytics encompasses a lot more than just what you read in the news. So it's important to keep an open mind. And this is not the only thing out there. Right now, it's sort of like flavor of the month. but. Personally, I'm not too excited because firstly, you have all that history behind you and secondly, there's so much more out there. So this is the cutting edge right in your browser. How cool is that? So actually, one more thing. This is the cutting edge, but there's also the bleeding edge. So if you look at this one, <coughs> Reinforce JS. <coughs> so it's a reinforcement learning library that implements common RL algorithms supported with fun web demos. Whatever that means. Okay, let's break it down. So everyone knows what data science is, right? And now hopefully, who here has, hasn't heard of data science before? Um, who, who has heard of, who hasn't heard of artificial intelligence before? Right, it's the next big thing, right? Again, it's flavor of the month. But what exactly is artificial intelligence? People are saying, get into it. It's the next big trend, right? As if you were at the panel just now, then everyone's really excited about it. But again, you know, data, what does data actually mean? And artificial intelligence, what does artificial intelligence actually mean? So artificial intelligence has a very specific definition. It means how do you, com how do you program an agent to function in an environment? And recall that our definition of data before this was how do you get information into a quantitative format? Right, previously we were working with the definition how do you get information into a quantitative format? And then that's what people are excited about, right? Because data brings information, brings profit in many situations. And now people are getting excited about AI, but what exactly is AI? AI is programming an agent to function intelligently in an environment. So is that the same as data? And does that definition gel with what you think AI is? So this is reinforcement learning is the algorithm behind AlphaGo. And AlphaGo sounds scary because it feels like machines are going to take over the world, right? <laughs> but again, what I want to dispel is the fact that, hey, you can actually train an AlphaGo-like algorithm right in your web browser. It's all actually just a massive matrix-matrix multiplication. So there's a lot of hype, but what I want to get across is that it's important to look past the hype and have a think about, people are saying AI is the next big thing. But is AI second generation data science? Or is it a completely different field altogether? So let's have a look at this library. What are you actually doing? So remember previously we had our playground and you were trying to classify blue from orange, right? Right now what you're trying to do is if you look at this one, Puck World, DQN. So this is your monster, like 
you know, Pac-Man and then something's coming along and trying to eat you. So this is your little monster and then this is the agent that you're trying to train here. So you're trying to train it to avoid this monster of doom. Right, and you see, okay, when it's avoiding it, it goes green. And it's trying to learn the boundaries. This is the environment and this is the agent here. So as you're training, you should see it get smarter and smarter because it's learning from its past experiences. So you see now the monster is coming to eat it and then it's turned red and then now it's away from the monster so it turns green. So what you're doing is that you're training it by rewarding it when it's going away and punishing it, so to speak, by when it, when it gets to the monster, the red part. So this is also why I said data is like my pet because you also train it like a kid. So I encourage, I encourage you to explore more about it. Reinforce JS is is all in your browser, and this guy, Andrej Karpathy, also has a course in computer vision at Stanford. So if you're technical, I also encourage you to check him out. Well, check out his, his courses and his blog. He's very good. And now he's at Tesla. So this is state of the art. But again, to emphasize, you also have this. This is also data. So data is everywhere and hopefully I've gotten you to have a think about what exactly is data and how do you get into it and what it really means. So another thing to look at is this one. So I had, hello, I had a lot of fun, is it okay if I speak like that? Okay, I had a lot of fun doing stuff like chicken rice compared to and one thing you see about This is over the past five years, but if you look over, say, the past seven days, and you restrict it to Singapore, and you look at... So what I found really interesting about this is that if you look at it, the spikes, the <laughs> highest amount of time that you see people searching for McDonald's is actually at 4 a.m. <laughs> in the morning. And here as well, 4 a.m. in the morning and then it dips. And then you get a rise again at 7, okay, people want their breakfast maybe, but actually throughout the day, it's pretty low and then suddenly at night you get oh no i I'm, I'm suddenly hungry where's the nearest mcdonald's and you see the spike at 4 a.m so this is this is an example of how this is why data gives you insights because you get an insight into somebody's behavior aggregated over time but what's also really nice is if you compare it to say chicken rice And you see that uh, chicken rice seems to have a seems to be pretty normal, like what you would expect. So you see, okay, 
people having dinner, and then it, it goes down as people try to sleep, and then somehow again, 5 a.m., <laughs> maybe people are getting ready for breakfast, and then again another spike at 12, okay, people are having lunch, right? So. Chicken rice follows the more normal pattern, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And then you have Pakute. Okay, let's remove. So what I like about this is that you see for for Baku there, you don't see a lot of activity in the morning. And then after that, okay, some searches for breakfast, for lunch, but then you have this really big spike here at 6 a.m. So you can see a story starting to form, right? For McDonald's, it's a desperate midnight, oh no, I'm hungry, what am I gonna do, kind of thing. And then chicken rice is that all-time favorite. Oh, lunch, dinner, you know, doesn't really matter, maybe in the morning. And then pakute seems to be a dinner thing. So you see this spike in the dinner time, and then for the rest of the day, okay, maybe, okay, 3 a.m., I don't know, but throughout the day, not so much. And then, yeah, at dinner, people want to have pakute. So this, you see, this gives you an insight into the role that food plays in our lives and also the habits of Singaporeans and what's going on in people's lives. So this is an idea of how data is accessible and how it's really cool as well. So have a, have a play around with trends with your partner and pick, an, pick one that interests you. And take about five minutes to do that and then we'll share what you've seen. on the search that we did, right? Mm -hmm. These are the search that Google has actually... Um, is it by the search yeah, engine? Yeah, mm. the search engine. Yeah. Okay, so it's so like, this is every, like, you know, you Google stuff. And this yeah. is the data that they've collected. Okay, so it's not, the, it's not like the, the actual... Facebook, for example, the search engine, it's not like the Facebook login. It's actually the search. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, what you type into the browser. Yeah, thing, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hey Fish, do you want to facilitate? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Like, um... Thank you. 
actually reflective of the human condition, you can say. It, it contains insights about human behavior, what's going on in people's, on people's minds. And so this is why data is special. So another question I get asked a lot is, how does data apply to me? How, how can I use it in a way that's beneficial, not only for my business, but for myself? And so to come back to my theme of always starting from where you are, rather than thinking about things about data in abstract terms like my job or a career, I thought, OK, let's start with yourselves. So I'm sure you've heard of the quantified self movement, Fitbit. Everyone's heard of Fitbit, right? Track your sleep, track your steps, track this, track that. So if you could track something, what would you track? And, and this is something, again, that sounds simple on the surface, but actually I feel it's not a trivial question. So again, like what is data? Sounds simple, but actually encompasses a lot. So tracking what matters is, again, what matters is a sounds simple, but it's actually not a trivial question. So to give you an example, 
if you have a Fitbit and the quantify itself and you want to track, right, the first thing you think, how many steps did I eat my vegetables today? How many hours of sleep? Who here is really interested in how many hours of sleep you got? Okay, let's, let's flip the question. Are you more interested in the number of hours that you've slept or the quality of your sleep? Right. So if you buy a Fitbit and it tells you how many hours you've slept, is that data that you want? then that's probably not data that you want. So to drive home the point, the point of this is to get you thinking about not only what is data, we, we've gone through the whole gamut of what is data. Now I want you to think about what is useful data. And a key thing that happens in, in work a lot is people say, oh, we have a lot of data, what can we do with it? And then, and then you go into it and none of the data is useful. And that's kind of a bummer because you could have spent all that time collecting real useful data. So again, starting with yourself, what do you want to track? So I had to think about this. And it was like, uh, uh, number of times I said thank you, does that, can I use that to, to show whether or not I'm being a nice person? What about how many times I said please, or how many times I, I opened the door for somebody? Things like that. And that's how I, if you think about the Dear Data project, you can use that for inspiration. They have a lot of metrics. So for this exercise, I'd like you to take about five minutes to think about, if you're working with the quantified self, what metric is meaningful to you? How will you measure your life? It's a meta deep question. <laughs> Did my kids go to uni? That is one metric. Did my kids turn out to be good people? That's another metric. <laughs> and um, think of the metric and then we'll have, we'll get people to share and ideally try and be creative. <laughs> Maybe with a tea. Yeah, <laughs> I <laughs> 
buat apa ni? Hi, so uh, so now it's about tracking what matters to the quantified self, right? So so I have a heart problem. So I need to finish ten thousand steps every day, right? So I track that steps every day. So so although I track it every day, but I never can get to my ten thousand step. So uh, so this uh, data actually is to quantify myself. Will help me to to get the ten thousand steps. So, but the thing is, at the end of the day, what do I do with it? Do I say that okay, but by, by 10 p.m. at night, so I'm at 5,000 steps. So I got to do another 5,000 steps before it is midnight. So, so do I go and run, or hey, never mind, continue to sleep? So that's how do I how do I do it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I think that's something really meaningful for yourself. And um, would you like to uh, pick someone else? for the next person for the sharing? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, then, anyone else want to share? Okay, we got someone on the back. <laughs> yeah, we also have another group discussion. Uh, <laughs> so, could you all imagine, like, emotions? It's also kind of inspired by um, Dear Data Project. So I think it's like, I want to measure, you know, my um, more positive feelings versus my negative feelings. Like what kind of, what, what kind of moments I feel a little bit maybe um, more positive and what's the trigger. And also uh, another group member, she would like to measure how much she can improve, you know, more like self-improvement within the day. Like how, how does that compare yesterday? So things like that. Very much. Would you like to share? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that outburst. Huh? Um, so I think that's something really meaningful. I I personally try to track my emotion as well, uh, and this is actually particular to only women. Uh, the app is called Clue, so you can try searching for that app. It's quite useful. Anyone else want to share? <laughs> How much water they drink? Water. How are you doing that right now? No, I'm not tracking. You can see some fish. Tracking. How are you doing? Okay, let's go to the Okay, this is really interesting. Let's let's all weigh in on this. So, um, anyone has some ideas on the fly? How do you quantify the quality of your relationship? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. What is it? Bye. Question was how do you quantify your relationship? I guess um, maybe you can track the number of interaction for a certain timeline, and then maybe also track the emotions in terms of positive versus negative over the same timeline, and then maybe add another data set uh, by tracking. Um, other interactions compared to other interactions. So that you have like a base data for that particular interaction, then you can use this data with another data set from a different relationship. Wow. 
<laughs> very, very nice answer. Okay, that, that's something to think about. So, what data is meaningful? And also, what are you comparing it to? Do you have a baseline? That's another thing to think about. So, any other ideas? How do you quantify a relationship? You wouldn't. Okay, Let, let's give you the floor. I think there's something that, I mean, it's, it's like going back to the discussion on ethics with regards to cloning. It's the same discussion when we had, or when, when the scientists had, when Dolly the clone ship came about. I don't know how many of you in this room remember Dolly the clone ship. That is, that's the right? Okay. Um, but, yeah, and, I, 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 and while science says that they can clone, even today, they can't go a human being. And the question is, how do you explain to the person how you came about, right, the existence of it? So something as something like emotion, something as something like feelings. I don't think I want science to interfere with that because a robot cannot have feelings, although they say you can emote or make it emote. That's a distinct between a human being and an artificial intelligence. I do not want an artificial intelligence to tell me how to feel. I will stay clear away from that. Okay, thank you. Okay, someone. So perhaps like the response, I think like perhaps like the response time of how a person responds to your messages. So let's say if you text your mom On the same day, I'm pretty sure you yeah, would have like a close relationship. But if somebody gets back to you like a week later, it could be maybe because your relationship's not that close and you need, you need some catching up. But yeah, then stuff like that would be fun. That can be a wrong assumption. Yeah, I, I have never watched this. Just just to share. So I watched this. It's a show I've we all probably watched before. So, so, uh, so there's this two guys were trying out this girl, right? So they both text her at <laughs> <laughs> the same time with the same content, and the girl responds to guy A first, and they all thought she's more interested in guy A, but actually not. She's more interested in guy B, so she's taking a longer time to formulate. So, so the assumption. <laughs> okay, very interesting, right? So, what if you get the wrong conclusion? You say, I really like this guy, I want to give him a good response, so I'm going to think about it, and then, and then give a good response. And actually, this is something that is not, it, it's something that people struggle with a lot, actually, in marketing, for example. You know, click-through rate? I'm sure you've heard of it. How many times someone clicks on your website? So the, the number of times that someone clicks on your website, does that actually mean they're engaged with it or they can't find what they're looking for? So then they're like randomly clicking around and trying to find something useful. So yeah, not a trivial problem. OK, Fish, do you want to close? So about that topic, about quantifying relationship? Um, so my colleague, uh, so by the way, I'm from Pablo. My colleague recently uh, grabbed the data about Li Shenlong's topic, and um, he analyzed their comments using um, a library um, sentiment analysis, basically. Uh, so he used that library, and then he used that to look at um, what are people's feeling about it. So I was actually thinking, if you actually analyze the text that you have been sending out to each other, um, maybe you can kind of see what's the sentiments you have towards each other, but then like throughout the discussion, it could be like everyone kind of um, uh, display their feelings differently, but just using a library or using a machine, which is not optimal right now to, to do that may not be the best way to actually look at your relationships, right? So um, I think I agree with uh, the lady earlier that maybe we don't want to do that right now. <laughs> okay, so many different opinions. I think that touched quite a strong chord with a lot of people. So maybe this is something you want to look more into when you 
get back home tonight. So two more things before we end, because we have 10 more minutes, right? So thank you, Fish. That was really cool. Um, further resources. You've all heard of Coursera, right? Um, that's not the only option. That's what I want to say again. Um, so MIT OpenCourseWare is one that you want to look into. And actually, even if you are talking about learning resources, Microsoft's library. So what, what can I do here? Um, So if you're talking about uh, machine learning, which is teaching machines how to learn, then you have a lot of notebooks on platforms. All these platforms are sort of like, it, it should be freely available. So Microsoft and also Amazon and, and all the, it, it's all out there. So. My point is that you have something called Jupyter Notebook. Uh, Jupyter. So if you're looking to learn from examples, no. gallery, Jupyter. Yes, this one. So a notebook has, a notebook is sort of like the cutting edge right now. So previously when you talk about code, you just share code. But then now what people are trying to do is that to share this is my problem, and then this is the code, and then this is what the code is doing with it. So you have something like, um, okay, Titanic passengers, coal mining disasters, and vessel speed changes. So then if you are looking to learn how to use data analysis and code, then these have a lot of good examples. So you have explanation and code explanation and then code and then also you get the output so you can actually see what the code is doing like here it's putting out this graph so there are just loads of examples for you to get started into if you want to learn psychology and neuroscience and analytics or machine learning statistics and probability physics chemistry biology whatever general Python programming is all here and you can just go crazy. But at the same time, you also have good old Microsoft Excel. That is really the tool for anyone looking to get started. Again, pen and paper was the cutting edge technology for the past 500 years, so don't forget that either. Another one is Kaggle. Who here knows about Kaggle? Okay, if you're looking for data sets to play with or learning to develop your skills, then it's got data sets, but also competitions, but also these are kernels that you can learn from. And crucially, what I find really useful are the winner's interviews. So these are competitions but what happens is that they interview the winners to find out what they did, and then the winners share their code. So you can effectively reproduce all the winning solutions to these competitions. So you have a huge spectrum. You have pen and paper, Excel, going into data visualization. If you are interested in statistics and machine learning, then you have Jupyter Notebooks. If you really want to get into learning, you have Kaggle. So it's not only about going for training or going for a massive open online course. There's a lot that you can do yourself. And then if you have a project, 
then you can that that's proof to somebody who might want to employ you that you've taken the initiative so these are stuff to check out and so finally I want to just do in the last five minutes do a quick what are you going to take away from this session what will you do now because it's all very well to explore data and what is meaningful data and how you can get started but what actually is your commitment going to be what is the one thing that you could do right now or even tomorrow I am going to open an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> that's all you might want to do or I am going to create an account on Kaggle that's another thing that you could do and and what I'd like you to do is to think of just one action even something as simple as download Microsoft Excel and open a spreadsheet you know even something like that just think about what's the one thing that you are going to do to learn more or explore more or even if you are saying I'm going to sleep on it tonight and decide that you know maybe analytics is not what I want to do that's fine too you know it's perfectly fine to decide that you want to I think the world needs more social scientists to be honest but then yeah but once you get started another thing that I want to keep I want you to keep in mind is that analytics is is a calling more than a career in the sense that it never ends um, before I went to Japan the state of the art was um, being able to recognize a cat from a dog and then I took a break right and then I came back and in one year's time it was like everything's completely changed here yeah, we can recognize a thousand different categories and you can just download this app on your phone and machine translation is better than humans the field changes like that and so you it's important to keep learning and and this is from Andrew Ng the founder of Coursera and and the Stanford professor so every Saturday you will have a choice between staying at home and reading research papers versus watching TV and there's no short-term reward to spending your weekends or your nights learning about data and analytics and machine learning but the secret is, is if you do this every weekend it accumulates and after a year most probably you can get to where you want to be and this is what I want to leave you with so take about a few minutes to think of the one action and talk about it with your partner
sadly to the end of our journey and I've really enjoyed myself thank you so much to fish and the sound system people and also the camera crew and getting us all set up and Microsoft and coding girls can we all give ourselves a big stop clap let's go one yeah okay so um final note my company is hiring. We work with National University of Singapore. If you're interested in teaching and also maybe a bit of research further down the road, talk to me. Or if you have any questions also, talk to me. Happy to chat. I'll be here. And yeah, go, go out and do your one action. <laughs> Thank you.